look at the dead. Um, the purpose of this presenta presentation is to produce a clear and concise translation of the Book of the Dead, uh, especially uh, the 42 laws of Ma'at or the 42 negative confessions, uh, whilst maintaining the integrity of the source material. The aim is to allow the modern eyes to travel through space and time and merge themselves into the body of an ancient Egyptian, having the capacity to experience all the sensual impressions received through the organs under the bright Egyptian sun. Uh, this writing is also, or this presentation is also developed to highlight the major faults and shortfallings in other translations of the Book of the Dead, including uh, uh, Wallace Budge's, Faulkner's, and others. Um, which will be labeled below, and to further correct said faults by giving the reader all the tools necessary to be an independent student in the ancient uh, Kemetic ways or the ancient Egyptian ways. It is also our aim to develop and transmit an authentic indigenous perspective pertaining to Egyptian way of life and on how the Egyptians perceive themselves, their culture, history, religion, language, and sciences. Okay, so now um, when we go into the uh, books of the dead, there are usually 10 major faults with them. And uh, it's usually a foreign culture. The first one will be a foreign cultural perspective. Uh, the translators usually uh, take on a Western mentality or a Christianic mentality um, in translating the Egyptian Book of the Dead and never really coming from an indigenous perspective. Uh, we usually find terms like heaven, underworld, netherworld, etc., within these translations, which is nowhere written with inside of the text. Um, also, is another um, major fault is a backwards orientation. Uh, sometimes they'll start the text off in the middle, slap bang in the middle of the text, or right at the back of the text, or completely miss out the vignettes, um, given it the context. Also, there is usually an incorrect hieroglyphic orientation. Uh, that's another way where they start the hieroglyphs, start reading from the wrong direction to the right direction. Uh, there may be correct, uh, grammatical errors, erroneous chapters, uh, mistranslations, uh, lack of word depth and possibilities, uh, lack of context, lack of scene description and explanation, and generally a disconnection from the scene, um, from the, from the scene in the text. So our solution, or what we're proposing today, is for all of us. Um, to kind of just give an input and uh, kind of fix those those problems um, by giving it a natural indigenous perspective. Um, yeah, uh, also a correct orientation of how to actually read the hieroglyphs, um, go through hieroglyph word construction, i.e. Uh, the different values the hieroglyph may hold and giving it a deeper context and meaning. Uh, to also go through the grammatical rules um, to show you how to read the chapters correctly, uh, give a correct translation, word definition and etymology, a apprehensive contextual explanation, full scene description and a full scene context. Okay. Um, we could go, I could go further and start reading off more, but that's not really the intention. The intention is actually just to go straight into, um, straight into the scene itself and actually be able to decode and decipher exactly what it's saying, the purpose of it, and what it means. So um, if I can just get some feedback from everybody, when we're talking about the 42 laws of Ma'at or the 42 negative confession, what's the first thing that comes to mind or what do we think about it? The Ten Commandments, Moses. <laughs> Any others? Are we all there? Are we all live? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so do we actually know what this is? What exactly um, is the purpose of these uh, 42 negative confessions? Has anybody got an idea of what these actually are? No? Come on. Come on. Let's get some input. Everybody talk. Wasn't this the when uh, before they were uh, students can go actually into the mystery system uh, to be initiated that they had to uh, confess that they did not that you know had any of them they had to go through the forty two negative confessions before okay. they could be accepted. It. Very good, very good, very good. Um, well, according to what's actually been left 
to us and the uh, descriptions um, pertaining to the Book of the Dead or the Pert um, Heru, it states that um, before one can actually enter into the uh, into the Usekh Ma'ati or the, the double halls of Ma'at, uh, they actually had to go through several trials and tribulations beforehand, several initiatic experiences. Um, and they also needed to know the uh, passwords and the past grips leading to the next degree. As you can see here, there is um, on either side, on the right hand side and on the left hand side, these are actually doors. And um, it's usually the scribe, or it's usually the, the Niter or the deity, Anupu, who will be standing at the door um, requesting uh, the password. Um, to enter through the doors, and you had to actually know the passwords to go through the doors. Now, the purpose of this, um, it stated that at the at the moment, of, there's actually two uh, ways of looking at this. This, I, this is either a text uh, for the here and the now, um, which is kind of parallel to when the Jews at the age of eight, at the age of thirteen to fourteen have something that's called a bar mitzvah or bar mikvah. Uh, a son of the Lord, a son of the rights. Um, literally, at that age, you become a man, and before becoming a man, you must know the um, the ethos or the rules or the laws governing the system, so you can be an, become an independent individual. And you go through a ritual where you have to recite and memorize uh, cert certain portions from the actual um, uh, Torah or from the actual law itself. And be able to recite this. So some say this is actually what is taking place now. When uh, an individual reaches the age of 13 or 14, um, they have to recite uh, these 42 negative confessions. Um, and there is another uh, way to view this also, which is attested in uh, Diodorus Siculus, uh, which is a first century, I believe, first century BC historian. He states that um, once a king or somebody of great importance uh, dies, there is usually a, um, a burial ritual that takes place over the time span of 72 uh, days. And on the 72nd day, or the very last day, um, where a great procession is taking place, um, different sacrifices, different songs, different hymns, um, colors, um, incense, all sorts, is, is taking place, and uh, the the sarcophagus is actually brought to the entrance of the tomb and is raised to the living perpendicular, facing uh, the south or the southern or the zenith or the south apex um, of the sky, which will be uh, the midday sun, um, and gathered around every gathered around the actual sarcophagus. Um, is the people, or the people that was his family, his friends, the people that he ruled over. And there will also be gathered uh, 42, or depending on how many gnomes were around at the time, um, usually ranging from 30 up to uh, 54, I believe, uh, so anywhere between those numbers. Um, each uh, high official or high priest from each of those gnomes will be gathered, and one of them will be uh, given the, uh, the title of Supreme Judge and would actually weigh, wear a medallion around their neck um, saying truth, which would be Ma'at. Um, and the 42 judges or a high priest would be there to actually um, be a council or, 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 or a, a, a council body that would actually recite all the great things that this person has done. And if anybody in the crowd uh, disagrees or has any grievance against the person who's about to be um, interred, uh, they're able to uh, come up and say exactly what it is. Um, and then this 42 negative confessions is kind of like a, um, a preemptive um, will or preemptive um, uh, rebuttal to anybody who has anything uh, negative to say about them. So basically refuting or renouncing any um, errors or wrongdoings that somebody may come up and uh, give. Um, and if the person is, is found to be truthful or ma'acheru, 
uh, true of voice or true of reasoning or true of action um, or victorious or vindicated, they're able to be um, interred therein and become an ahu or a living being or a star, uh, being able to be transfigured into a star or somebody who is constantly giving off um, sustenance. Um, but if they aren't and they are found guilty, um, they will be they will be given to Amut. Um, this will be the creature called Amut here. Um, in a metaphorical sense, they wouldn't be allowed or they'll be consumed and they wouldn't be allowed uh, to enter the land of the blessed dead or the land of the ancestors, the living ancestors. Um, so it was a thing of... Um, you know, you when you we in Islam you have the same of uh, Yam Yam El Kemar, um, the day of standing. So this is the day when you will be resurrected, or the day that you will be uh, raised to the uh, living perpendicular. And if you are not judged um, correctly, or if you've done something bad in your life, you'll be sent to the hellfire or to the pits. Uh, this is kind of the same uh, type of context. You won't be able to enter into the land of the blessed, but you will actually be um, left outside um, in a form of purgatory or hell. I'm not saying a literal purgatory or a literal hell, but just metaphorically. Um, so these 42 negative negations, they say, is just to basically uh, rebuke any rebuke or rebuke any claims uh, brought up against them. So those are the two um, views. It's either something that is done in the here and the now, or something that is recited when one is actually uh, about to be interred. Has anybody got anything to say on that, or any views? No. Okay. Ujau. Um, I don't know if you're ready to do some um, transliteration or translation. You there? Yeah, what's up? Um, uh, no, I'm not quite prepared. I'm actually multitasking, doing some things in the house. I'm, I'm, I'm listening. Cool. Uh, but I'm. Do you want to chime in at any time, though? Do you want to say anything? Have I said anything that you didn't quite agree with, or? Uh, no, no. Uh, what you said um, is sound. The only thing I would I would add is that um, the two perspectives is either either for the deceased person or what would be called an initiate. Yes. So it would be for an, a living person who is an initiate who on a daily basis goes through a, a judgment of themselves and it would be that internal, so-called internal voice that would... Um, bear witness for them when they do these declarations of sin and you know as they as they call them negative confessions we should we should you know kinda push that to the side and and properly refer them to uh, declarations of innocence or or something to that effect but by going by going through it on a nightly basis or a daily basis uh, at night at the close of day you you can honestly go through these 42 um, statements and truthfully say if you have done it or if you haven't and your conscience will will actually condemn you and then by you doing it over and over again it will actually start to uh, help you because it will start to instruct you instead of condemning you at first it will switch over to instructing you in your daily life and your daily routine so even though you're conscious and you're awake and you're doing your business for the day your conscious will come to the forefront and remind you of these uh, 42 statements and you'll start putting your life in order and living your life according to Ma'at. So that was one of the um, functions and purposes for, for this uh, initiation and this routine. Definitely. Well said, well said. Well said. Okay. All right. Um, so earlier on, we actually talked about um, the Egyptologists, such as Budge and others, actually uh, translating or translating it or mistranslating uh, this text, also um, with incorrect orientation or, or different things that they actually leave out. Um, so before we read the very first one, um, can someone read out um, their translation of 
um, the 42 negative conversions. Read all 42? Uh, just one. Just read the first one. I have not done inequity. Okay. So that's, they usually start off at the very first one, which is I have not uh, committed or, or any evil or committed any sin or have not done any iniquity um, as such. Um, and we can find that um, you're reading from whose translation is that or who in which book? I couldn't find mine, so I'm using uh, Yusef Ben Yakiman's African Origins of Western Religion. Okay. So we find in that one, it starts off with, um, I have not uh, done any evil or um, iniquity. Um, we have it here with Wallace Budge, and it states here, I have not committed any sin or committed sin. Um, but let's go down to the actual text itself, and we can get a clearer perspective of, act of what is actually going on. Now, first of all, we need to establish the correct orientation of how to read um, the hieroglyphs or read uh, this text full stop. Um, and to read this text, we usually start from where um, the animals or the human beings or the faces are actually facing, which direction it's facing, and we read into it. So for example, if we look at the 42 deities down here, we can see that they're all facing to the right. So that gives us an indication that we start reading from the right inwards. So from the right to the left. And if we zoom in up here, uh, get a bit clearer, we can actually see there is a human being, a kind of stick figure facing the right. So that gives us the indication we read from the right um, into the left. Um, again here when we have the, the, the snake, we can see or the cobra that we read in from the right to the left, etc. So this is actually how we read and that's how we start off our trends, uh, start off actually decoding the hieroglyphs. Um, so we'll start from over here, this is the first one. But well, what has taken place is um, in the translations that we get from Budge online, and um, in other places, they actually skip um, a whole lot of text, and the orientation is incorrect. They actually start reading um, from the left going towards the right, which, as we can see, will be incorrect because we have to read from the right going into the left. So over here, um, just to actually speed things up, they've actually skipped a lot of things, and they've said that they've actually started all the way down here then starting all the way from the beginning. So they've got it right here where it says um, there is actually a, a, a hand here or an arm uh, facing downwards, two, two arms facing downwards, which reads nu or no or nu, basically no or, or a negation, a negative uh, term. And this one here is the I, which reads ari or ar, iri or ari. And this is um, to be me, which is a... Um, uh, the suffix uh, say, uh, possessive to say me. So I have, I have not done or I have not made um, as foot. This word here is as foot, which it can be translated as evil, um, iniquity, or sin, or committed anything wrong. So over here we see that this is the very first one um, in Budget translation, other people's translation, saying. Um, Nu ari as foot or nu ari is foot. Not have I committed any sin, but this is actually the forty-second um, negative confession rather than the first confession. Um, and if we go over here to the very beginning of the text, um, this is actually where we start. So if you're able to, um, no, before we go into that. You can actually start reading it from the very uh, beginning of the text, and it will be starting from over here. And the beginning of the text, it says here, Yahed Jabehu Perma Tashe. So this here says, Ya, Ya. This here is actually a read to say, uh, it's a Y, and somebody actually calling out. 
Um, if you could just imagine somebody standing up and um, raising their hand to call out somebody saying, yeah, um, which is kind of like a, a, a term just to call someone. As we may say today, um, yo or, or whatever you may have, or hey. So this is basically it. Um, we're actually calling out to someone. So we're saying, yeah. And the next term that's, or the next word that's used here is the word hedge. Hedge. Okay. Um, this word hedge um, literally means white or brilliant, a brilliant white. Okay, or brilliant color or white, very sparkling, shining color. Um, the actual, the actual uh, word hedge is also uh, synonymous with the word um, oryx, which is where we get uh, we get um, in mythology um, the oryx or the oryx is considered to be the unicorn um, when one of its horn is broken off. Um, is considered to, to to be the unicorn, where the where the um, the kind of starting of what we call a unicorn. But the hedge was um, completely uh, was very white in complexion, so they called it hedge, or they gave that terminology hedge to the same to the actual uh, oryx, and they gave it to this symbol here, hedge. Uh, so it says o oh, white, and the next term here is behu, or beh, which is um, a tusk or a teeth. And this is uh, the plurality to say Yahej Behu, um, which is basically being meaning all white teeth, all white teeth. Um, and this one here is Par, Par. It means to come out or to ascend or to um, yes, yeah, so coming forth. So coming forth or to ascend or to come out. Um, so Per, Perma or Per M, Perma. Um, to come from tashe. This word here is a teat or a ta, meaning the earth, and she is actually to do with a lake. So this um, is to say coming forth from the lake land. So if we read it all out, ya, ya hedge, ya hedge abihu, perma tashe. So this is basically saying, oh, white teeth coming forth. From the lake land, okay, and we're actually calling out to, to, to this deity over here. Um, so we're actually speaking to this deity. We give it, we're calling him out and honoring him, and um, giving him an epithet of uh, being white of teeth. Now, if we actually go, um, if we understand that this is actually talking about the 42 gnomes in um, in Egypt, and we take a trip down to the f to the beginning or the beginning the first cataract um, which would be in Aswan uh, region um, there is actually a gnome uh, dedicated to the deity uh, Subek there is actually a deity uh, called Subek which is located at the first um, the first cataract in Upper Egypt um, in Komombo, um, and this deity Sebek is basically a deity, a, a crocodile deity. So if you could just imagine um, somebody's white teeth, or or an, our, our crocodile's white teeth, this is what they're calling out to the deity of the white teeth um, that's located in Komombo, which would be uh, near Tasseti, um, the first cataract. So we're actually in Upper Egypt at this at this moment. Uh, calling out to the deity Subek, and we're saying over here in a negative term, uh, nu, meaning no or a negative or not, uh, sma, uh, sma literally mean to cause to slay. Uh, the s is actually a causative, ma is to slay or to slaughter. So not have I caused to slay. Uh, let's read it. Uh, so we're saying right here, not have I slain with ma or ma right here is actually a um uh, a preposition to be in with or in or off or belonging. Uh, so not have I slain with um and you see here is somebody's arm. Um, so this is saying not have I slain with my arm. Um, right here is a cow, 
which will be um, uh, which is the term ka, and it's the ka neteri or the sacred cow, or the deity's cow, or the neter's cow. So not have I slain uh, the deity's cow. Not have I slain, um, ka can also mean virility, or um, life force, or power. So not have I slain the sacred life force, the sacred power, or the sacred cow. Um, so this is in reference to actually not slaying the sacred cow. Has anybody got any questions or anything to build on? No. I was wondering if Ujjawu had anything to say and actually give us uh, any alternative um, rendering of the glyph. No, he's quiet there. He's quiet. All right. Yeah, he said he's going to be in and out. Cool. And one of the major things that we should actually uh, pay attention to, there is actually um, some type of pattern that is emerging as well when we look at these glyphs. For example, with, the, with these deities, um, can you see any pattern um, transpiring here? Just by looking at the deities. I see, uh, it's like two... Let me see, two, one, two. Mm. It's like the ones with the white. It's like a skip. It's like a two, one, two, 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 one. We have a look. Can you see there's a pattern of um, uh, uh, kind of like a white, green, red, white, green, red, white, green, yeah. red, white, green, red um, that's taking place? Yes. So there might be actually some type of significance um, to that as well. So okay, so if we go to the next one, um, so if we if you can go to Budge's book um, and actually read the forty second, um, the forty second one to actually see what his translation says, or to. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Ben's book to see if it matches up to um, not have I slain the sacred cow that we've just uh, said here. Yeah, we said a 40 second. 40 second. I have not thought scorn of the God who is in the city. Let me go get my other one. Let me go get my other book. Kufu? Are you there, my brother? Well, according to... Um, I'm here. What's going on? Yeah, see if you want to just chime in at any point. All right, go ahead, man. I'm just listening. Cool. If there's anything that's missing that you want added or to be uh, placed, put in context, just let me know. Okay. Okay. And so this is uh, uh, Gramercy's um, The Book of the Dead. Um, and they said here, I have not slain uh, the cattle belonging to the god. Um, I don't know if anybody has Budge's translation. Uh, this is actually uh, the papyrus of what they call Annie, uh, but he's truthful or he's right, or the correct pronunciation or the correct way his name is actually spelt is um, Anui. Anui. It's not actually Annie, but it's Anui. So if anybody has a translation of that, we can kind of yeah, see. Yeah, I have both. I'm trying to find it now. Be While we're waiting, um, let me just zoom out because um, the Egyptians have done a very clever thing here. 
Um, can you see smack bang in the middle? Um, we have this deity here. Um, which would be considered to be um, Nun, um, the watery one. And in his right hand, he's holding the, um, the eye of uh, Horus, or the eye of Heru, or Haru. Um, which is also known as the Wajet, uh, to mean health or prosperity. And then in his left hand, um, he's got his arm uh, hovering over um, what appears to be a lake or a pool of water. And what is very interesting uh, to note, if we actually start counting, um, you know, the way that Egyptians mix uh, their art uh, with the literature is actually phenomenal. Um, if we start counting here, we see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, whoa. Oh. I didn't go too good. 20, where are we? I think we were roughly here. Um, then there's 21, there's 22. And um, if you know about um, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, you know that there's 22 uh, gnomes in Upper Egypt, while there is 20, 20 gnomes in Lower Egypt. So if we start counting, there should be one. Uh, there should be 20 gnomes on the other side, or 20 uh, deities corresponding to the uh, 20 gnomes in Lower Egypt. Um, so if we start counting from, let's say, here. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I actually counted it wrong. I should have counted it from here. Um, so there's 20 gnomes in uh, Lower Egypt, and we know that Heru or Haru was actually uh, the kind of the governor or the um, the uh, the deity of Lower Egypt, and uh, Taseti, where the lake land is, um, was for Upper Egypt. And we can also see the in the iconography as well. Um, we have here. Um, uh, the feather of Upper Egypt and the uh, cobra of Lower Egypt as well, um, which could also represent, um, you know, the, the dual natures of a reptilian on the left-hand side, um, which would be the left-hand side of the portion of your brain, and the uh, mammalian side, um, or the vault, or the uh, avarian side of the brain, which would be the right-hand side, uh, the upper and lower Egypt. So we could, from a metaphysical standpoint, uh, we can see that there is a lot of um, encoding inside of the, the Book of the Dead, or the 42 Laws of Ma'at itself. Oh, did you have the, um, the translation? Did you find the translation? I can't find it, bro. <laughs> All right, cool. Never mind. All right, so we have here anyway, uh, they give it as, I have not slain the cattle belonging to the god, and we translated it as, uh, not have I slain um, the sacred cow. So we can see that it, it, um, it measures up. The only difference is they've got it as number 42, um, and we have it as number one. And they've completely skipped out um, the context of um, what's going on, who is it actually being addressed to, and it's actually being addressed to a deity um, called uh, Hej Behu, or white teeth, that we say is Sebek, um, this could be conjecture, but let's just say for now, uh, it's safe to say that it's Hej Behu, which is the white teeth 
uh, found in the lakeland and we're saying not have I slain the sacred cow okay um, if we move on to the second one which will be up here um, so I don't know if everybody's seen there's a pattern going on as well up here there is just um, the ya uh, basically saying oh or oh, hey. Um, so all of them starts off with calling uh, to someone. And this one here is. Is everybody there? Okay. Uh, this one here is. Ya ana auf per emati. So ya ana auf per maati. So we have here ya meaning o. Oh. Um, Anna, or, or yeah, Anna, uh, meaning to uh, to carry or to bring or to bear something. As you can see, there is uh, somebody's legs uh, that's bearing a water um, a water jug or a, a water pot here. Um, so this basically means to bring something. Um, ya Anna, and we have here an arm. Um, just the market is actually we're talking about an, an idea right now, which is an ideogram. So it's marking it to say we're talking about an arm. So it's O bringer of an arm, and down here um, we actually have uh, the possessor. So this here actually says uf or f. Um, so we know it's talking about a masculine male, and it's saying O bringer of his arm or O bringer of his hand. Okay, um, and then we have here. Yeah, sorry, we have here um, per per, which we already know means to ascend or to come out. Um, perma, come forth, um, and we have here uh, the two feathers. Uh, these two feathers represent. Uh, the feather of ma'at, and as we see here, we have two feathers of ma'at. Uh, so we're saying ma'ati, um, uh, ma'ati. So we're saying basically um, two of the two ma'ats. So we're saying two ma'ats here, or of truth and justice. It can be translated as. So we're saying, O oh, bringer of his arm, um, coming forth from ma'ati. So this we're speaking to this being here, um, and usually um, this epithet is goes towards either Anupu or it goes towards um, another form of Haru. Um, but if we go into the list of gnomes, we can kind of um, glean who exactly it's talking about. Um, so yeah, so the very first gnome um, in Upper Egypt is actually Tarseti in Aswan, uh, which is to do with the land of the bows, and Sebek um, was known to be that deity over there. And then we got here uh, Wajes Hor, or Jebba, or Edfu, and this is the throne of Horus. So we can say for the time being, this may be talking about uh, the deity um, Horus or Haru and we can get some further clarification when we start reading down here um, so it says here no again which is a negation so anytime you see this uh, symbol here it's actually two arms face down and it's a negation to say something is negative um, so it's like no power or, or no authority or no I'm not doing something um, and it says here uh, it says here, no, 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 Nunahem machen foot, Nahen sakasati, Niter nauti. So this basically means um, uh, not or no, not have I 
taken. So this word here, nahemma, uh, means taken. And this means here, ma'ad, I taken. And we have the word here, khenfut. And below here is a determinative to let us know it's talking about food or cake. Um, so we say, not have I taken um, uh, nechen. Nechen. Nechen means uh, children. Okay, so it's saying, not have I taken the children's uh, bread or offering or cakes or food. Yes. Um, and then we have here the word uh, seka. Seka. Uh, seka sat. Actually, seka sat. E. And it's actually saying, not have I uh, uh, lifted or raised, uh, not have I lifted or raised um, my voice. Um, it's basically in terms of not, not rising your voice or not um, speaking hoftily um, to the niter na'ut. Um, so basically, not have I raised my voice uh, to the um, deity of my town or the deity of my gnome. Um, so that's what it's saying here. So not have I um, taken or stolen um, the children's food or offerings or bread, um, nor have I risen or raised or spoken hoftily um, to the deity of my town. Um, so if we go to the actual translation, and see how close our translation is. It says here, I have not snatched away the bread of the child, nor take or nor treated with contempt the God of my city. Um, so we can see from that that our translation is um, is very much similar. Um, mm. Their rendering is different. Um, if anybody has anything to say, please do. I don't actually want to be a mic hog. <laughs> <laughs> I found the other translation from Bulge. He has hail thou who bringest thy arm who cometh forth from the city of Mati. I have not fixed the food of the infants, neither have I sinned against the God of my native town. Yeah. That's pretty good. So that's very similar to what we've actually um, deduced from that. Um, so he actually included in his one um, the preamble, which is calling out to the deities. Um, could you just repeat that, what he says, his very first ones? Um, so we, we translated the very, first, um, the very first one up here. Yes. Second one, should I say. It says, Ya Anna, Ya Anna Aouf, Perma, Perma Maati. So we're saying here that, um, O bringer of his arm um, coming forth from the double Maat or from truth and justice. So what does he translate that as? He says, Hail, thou who bringest my, thy arm, who cometh forth from the city of Maati. Okay, okay. And then we translated this bit as Nu Nehemma I Chen Foot. Not have I taken um, the food, the food or the bread or the cakes. Nu. Um, so not have I taken the food or the bread or the cakes. Nehen um, uh, uh, from the children. Um, so what's he what's he got here for that bit? He has the uh, the food of the infants, mm -hmm. and neither have I sinned against the God of my native town. Okay. Or city. The Kasati, uh, not have I spoken hoftily um, or raised myself um, to the Niter 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 Nauti. Um, so we've got here, Niter Naut T. So not have I um, raised my voice or spoken loftily 
uh, uh, to the deity of my town. So what does he have there, sir? Yes, neither have I sinned against the God of my native town. Okay. It's close. So it's pretty much close. Uh huh. All right. So we're gonna move. So where are we starting from now? Let me see. Tell me. Do we read this one? This one? This one? This one? Which one? Tell me which one. Do we read? This one. This one. That one. This the. It'll be the third. Come over right okay. there. Okay. Cool. And which direction are we reading from? We're gonna read from um uh, from the uh from from the right. Okay. In two. In two. Okay. From, by now, what does this one say? We've we've said it quite a few times. <sighs> this beginning uh in the red. When we call, oh. how do we call someone? Oh, that's the that's the uh, the hey the how. Uh, yeah, that's that. That's the yeah or, or yeah, yeah, or, yeah. What we say in, in in the hip hop culture, yo. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hey yo. Hey yo. So that would be that principle that's taking place here. So we're calling out to a deity right now. Um. So we've got here, ya jiao zetep, ya jiao zetep, perma, per. Ma kara. So yes, um Ya Zhao Zetep Perma Kara. Okay. Um so basically we're saying here O Zhaoza or Josa or Zauza. Um we might I hear this as uh top or tep. O sacred head. Uh Zhaoza literally means sacred and tep means head. Uh, so O sacred head um per which means ascending or coming forth or coming from perma coming from um, and then we got here the word kara and um, in here we, it gives you the determinative to make us know what it's talking about uh, when we talk about ka ka is to do with somebody's spirit and then ra could also be with somebody's mouth or tomb or, um, or a chapter or something along them lines, uh, the mouth of something, um, something that's inside, uh, or the beginning of something. So this is actually talking about um, the shrine. So we're saying, O oh, sacred head coming forth from um, from uh, the shrine, from he shrine, but it's actually from the shrine because there's no um, word to say he shrine. But it says, so it says, O oh, sacred head coming forth or ascending from his shrine or coming from the shrine okay or coming from this this uh the mouth of the spirit um so that's what we have here um if we go into budge let's see what budge has translated that as <clears throat> he says hail thou who thou set in order the head who cometh forth from thy shrine Okay, so he's got here um, order, ordered head, instead of sacred. Is that correct? Yeah, he has ordered the head, yes. Yeah. Set in order the head, yes. All right. All right. And then, so we're speaking to this deity here. So we're actually speaking uh, to Zhao Zetep here. This is Zhao Zetep that we're speaking to. The sacred head, um, who's coming forth from his shrine, and we're greeting him, um, and we're now about to say, what does this red one here with the two arms facing down? What does that mean? That's like that's the negative. That's like the no power. That's correct. All right. Um, so as we can see here, this these two are pretty much similar. Um, I don't know if you remember what we said here, but um, we'll read it again. We'll read what it says here. Um, so it says, Nunhemma'i uh, khenfut ri'ahu. 
So nun hem ma i chen fut. Nun hem ma i chen fut ri ahu. Nun hem ma i chen fut ri ahu. Nun hem ma i chen fut ri ahu. Okay. So it's basically saying here, um, no power or not have I um, taken uh, the offerings, chen fut. Uh, not have I taken the offerings or the bread or the food. Um, and then this word here, ri, um, literally means to um, or towards. Um, yeah, it literally means to or towards uh, or belonging to or belonging to, to, towards, um, anything of that um, manner. And the ahu, ahu. Before earlier on, we talked about the ahu, and this ahu is talking about um, the ancestors. So we're talking about the ancestors here. Um, so we can see that there's a pattern going on here. Um, so not have I taken the bread or the offerings um, belonging to the ancestors. Over here it says not have we. If we skip back, it says not have I taken the children's. Um, bread or offerings and over here it says not have I slain uh, the sacred cow so a lot of these ones are talking about food so if mm. we look into the um, the mentality of the ancient Egyptians it seems like the offerings or foods were very um, important and to take the children's bread or the children's food away from them was a grave sin um, and to also take the um, the offerings or food uh, that we meant that we leave to the ancestors um, whether every single day that we prepare our foods in the morning, uh, we eat our breakfast, uh, we should be leaving out a portion of food uh, for the ancestors, or possibly have um, images or or um, statues um, uh, for our parents, our immediate ancestors, all the way to our ancient ancestors. And uh, there was a there was actually a ritual that was done where you would put. Uh, the freshly cooked food uh, in front of the statue of uh, the deity or the ancestors and you would watch um, as the deities fed on the food or the ka of the deity would actually be um, uh, eating the ka of the actual food itself um, and we would actually we would visualize this or the way that we would metaphor or um, uh, how can I say it? Uh, symbolically see this um, interaction taking place is whilst the steam of the food, the ether of the food is actually lifting in the air and um, it appears that the deities were soaking it in through the actual statue itself and after the food had cooled down and we have said our, our, our recitation to say that we're given the cup or the cup of the food to the cut of the ancestor um, after the food is cooled down and we have seen that the ancestors have been uh, fulfilled or eaten because the food is now warm for our consumption so the ancestors are eating now we are supposed to eat um, so in their minds uh, to not actually feed the ancestors was a grave sin and one of the um, rituals that I do uh, personally is actually um, have a statue or statuettes um, where in the mornings or certain times that I, I actually eat food and I prepare food I just leave it there to cool and um, just remembering the ancestors or remembering my my mother and father who is alive here and now um, but I'm not with them but just to say I have I have you in mind and I'm willing to feed you at all times uh, and I usually just look leave my food there to cool down while I watch or go about my business um, until it cools down but uh, spiritually I feel connected and I'm doing something like I'm feeding them um, in the spiritual plane um, but if anybody wants to actually say anything please do mm. well, Bo says I have not plundered the offerings to the blessed dead so that's the ancestors so that's the correct Hmm. Israel Doctrine. Is he there? He's in here somewhere. Okay. All right. 
Everybody's just being mighty quiet. <laughs> <laughs> they learn. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Learning is a two-way thing. Uh, I want to learn from everybody else. I don't want to just hear my voice. Um, I think I'm going to just do another one or uh, two. Well, I can add in, too, as far as the um, uh, divinizing the statue. Um, I have some sources where they were, uh, say that how the, um, the ancients would take the foreleg of a bull and I guess cut it um, in a way that when they separated from the body, that it would still move. You know, you ever seen that when the animal is, you know, still moving even when uh, it's supposed to be dead? Yes. Yeah, so they would take the foreleg part of the animal that was still moving from being, you know, by being cut the way it was cut and mm -hmm. put it up against the statue to, uh, I guess, energi uh, energize the statue. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, they would do that to the statue. It's kind of like an um, opening of the mouth ceremony uh, to actually give the the. It's not so much the statue itself, but it's the spirit or the soul or the ba or the ka uh, behind the statue um, to energize it. Um, because obviously the ka, which will be the cow. Um, was a very uh, powerful thing that it represents sechem, which is to do with power or energy or strength. Um, so we have to also watch what we eat. So they actually ate beef um, or that particular joint of the beef uh, to give them power, and they realize that it has a lot of. Even today, we realize that uh, beef has a, a lot of protein with inside of it. So in terms of the sechem, the actual physical sechem which is the protein within inside of the meat, um, they actually were on point to know that the foreleg of a, a cow had a lot of um, sechem or power within inside of it. It was also a synchristic, a synchriosic, synchri, synchri, hmm. it actually synced also um, with the stars or the constellation, which I think it would be the Usa Major or the Bear uh, constellation, which is shaped like um, in their mythology or uh, cosmology, like the foreleg of a um, of a cow as well. So that's how it actually uh, ties in. So they was doing it on all levels, on heaven and on earth, um, in terms of lining up with power. Yeah, as well as um, it talks. Uh, there's some things to talk about the tears, like say one of your um, your family members have deceased. Uh, the importance of tears, uh, the energy or the memory being embedded within the tears. So, like, say if you cry and you think about your ancestors, uh, it's I can't remember what they called it, but it's something about uh, the essence of the tears that makes them feel close to you. Mm. I'm gonna try to find that reference for you, but um, that's, that's powerful. That's real powerful. Um, so they were kind of uh, stressing the importance of crying as far as, you know, um, being close to someone. Wow. Okay. Actually, I think you have it. You have the breathing flesh. I, oh, you, you, you sent it to me, yeah. So I'll, I'll, yeah. Definitely have, I'll definitely have a look on this. Um, yeah, and that was a quote from the coffin text. But after, um, it's in the breathing flesh, but it was a... Uh, uh, a concept from out of the coffin text. Cool. So here we go. Um, so can somebody read this first um, line here? Or this first one? Nahisi. Where is he at? Oh, I'm right here. Yeah. This is this is your big brother. <laughs> What's that? Just this first word. I hope. Okay, you're on mute. Okay, here we go. I will take care of something. All right, where we at? So we're in the fourth one right now. Okay, that's. Like you said, that's the yo. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah. This is actually um, uh, um, a symbol that is actually in the beginning of your name. 
I wanted to see if you can actually recognize it. Oh. If you've if, have you ever seen your name spelled in hieroglyphs? No. No. Okay, well this here is the Neh or the Nehisi bird. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So uh, this word here actually says um uh Neheb. Neheb nefertu. So if we read this right now, it says Ya Neheb nefertu perma tepetuf. So ya ya neheb nefertu perma well that was a bit too much. Okay, that's clear. That's real clear. <laughs> so here we go again. So um yeah. Ya neheb ya neheb nefertu perma tepetuf. Okay, so we're saying here um o joiner of good. Or, or beauty, or joiner of beauty. Uh, the word here, neheb, uh, means to join. So we're saying here that this person is a joiner of nefer. We will kind of term nefer to, or nefer, or nefer, or nufar, or neferi, or neferti, uh, is to be good or beautiful. Um, so it's actually talking about beautiful things, or good things, because it's a pluralization here. I see these three little dots. Usually, it's either three dots or three um, lines, and it's a pluralization. So we're saying here, ya neheb nefertu, ya neheb nefertu. So, O oh, joiner of good things or beautiful things or fresh things, um, and it's what here per. So again, anytime you see here perma, so the the p, um, this is like a house basically. This is like a courtyard of a house, and this is actually a mouth walking on legs. Um, so it's to come forth, yeah. So it's to come out of the mouth of your house. Okay. So anytime we see this, we can see that there is actually a um, there's a pattern taking place. So even from over here, we see that the same P. Okay, with the mouth. Taking, okay. Yeah. So anytime you read it, so from now onwards, I'm gonna call you to actually say the ya at the at the top, um, the perma at the at the bottom. This is two words, pari or par or per, uh, means to come forth uh, from, which is the ma. So it's so anytime you see this one is perma. So there's three things that you know now. This is the ya, this is the perma, and this is the nu. So anytime I ask you, you should know those three things. Ya is to call, perma is to come forth, and no is the negative, or to say no, or no power by giving, or no power. So anyways, we're going to go back here, so it says, uh, perma uh, tepet, tepet hoof, okay? Um, so this word here, um, tepet hoof, or tepet, the actual word is tepet. Um, which means cavern or cave, uh, cavern really. So uh, coming out of his cavern. So the F at the bottom, anytime you see this uh, horned viper, it's actually at the end of a word, it's like a suffix, um, is to denote um, huh, uh, suffix uh, pronoun. I know Ujjawa will be beating me up right about now. Um, for not having my grammar on point, but it's basically a possession to say that um, he possesses uh, this cavern or it belongs to him. Um, so it's basically saying here, Yanehebka, uh, nope, no, what am I saying? Yanaheb nefertu perma tephetuf. So, um, O joiner of good things coming forth from uh, his cavern. Okay, so we're speaking to this deity here. Okay, so we've just called out to him and we're actually addressing him as he's in front of our face right now. So we're addressing him and we're saying here, that's the, it's still going to be negative, the not, the no. That's right. The and we've actually kind of seen this word at the top here. Um, where it meant white or brilliant white, but in this term here, it actually doesn't mean 
uh, white is actually um, given reference to the mace itself. And okay. if you hit something with a mace, um, you usually uh, bring it uh, pain or, or destroy it or bring it to ruin. Um, so okay. over here it says, um, uh, New Hedge Pautu, New Hedge, New Hedge. Pautu Niterum. Um, so Pautu, um, actually, um, this is the Pa, this is the U, this is the T, um, and this is actually offerings or bread. Yet yeah, again, as you can see, it's always to do with bread or food or offerings um, of the Niterum. So you're actually saying here, New uh, Hedge Pautu, New Hedge Pautu. New hedge pautu niteru, new hedge pautu, new hedge pautu niterau. That's it. New hedge pautu niterau. So we're actually saying here, um, not have I ruined um, the sacred pawut uh, all. So that's the, um, the origin. So we're talking about uh, the sacred offerings of the niteru. So not have I ruined the sacred offerings of the Niteru. Um, so we can get the translation from Budge and see what he translates um, this as. Okay, here's his uh, Hail Nahem Nefer, who come forth from thy hiding place. I have not defrauded the offerings of the gods. Okay. So he's translated um, tavern as yeah. caverns as um, hiding place. Um, he's oh, sorry. Let's go back actually to what does he call this this deity here? Uh. uh okay. Uh, Nehebka. Nehebka. No, I think you're reading the 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 next one. It should be. Uh, oh yeah, it's a uh, ne. Nahel Nefer Nefer. Okay, does he have a T at the end? Yes. Okay. So yeah, um, yeah. So there is a T at the end. I think I thought he didn't put it. So there is definitely a T in the pluralization. So yeah, ya Nahel Nefer too. Um, carry on. What does he say? Who cometh forth from thy hiding place? And we've got here cometh forth from his cavern. Yes. Okay. Um, and tep, literally, if we was to actually break it down etymologically, etymologically, we have the word here tep, um, tep, which literally means um, the head of something, and then we have het or hut, um, which means um, uh, literally like a temple or a house or hut, uh, yeah. as we can see by this determinative here. So it's literally the head house. Uh, we've got here the caverns, or his caverns. Okay, um, so the next section here, what does he translate that as? He is, uh, I have not defrauded the offerings of the gods. Okay, so we've got here ruined, uh, based upon this, um, the offerings, the sacred offerings, the original offerings of uh, the deities or the gods. Um, the Niteru down here. So, okay, so it's pretty much um, similar. Okay, I think this is going to be the last one. I'm going to just do the fifth one, round it up, and we can do the rest um, for another day or for, we can break it up into a series or something. Um, so I got, I'll ask I got, you. I got a question. Yeah, yeah, I got a question. I was, I was listening in and um, probably, probably set for a different hangout maybe, but uh, the pronunciations that you're using. And the, um, I guess the prose or the chanting that you're using um, may want to do another hangout or whatever to how you came to your pronunciations. Because to me it sounds, um, uh, I've, I've heard uh, Quranic chants and everything, especially with Semitic, with uh, Hebrew and Arabic, and it sounds very similar and not similar to the more inner Africa, African um, way of saying or pronouncing the words. Like for example, um, Nefertu, I know on a, on a feminine 
words such as neferet, as in Egyptology speak, the plural or the W is placed before the T ending in, in the way that the grammar is um, written or that it's spelled out. But I, I know that, that in, in Semitic languages we would say tu at the end to pluralize it or the U at the end of words, but for feminine the U would be before the, the uh, actual T. So I was just wondering, uh, maybe if you don't have time now, but maybe uh, can explain uh, the pronunciations that you're using. Okay, definitely. Um, just quickly, um, the pronunciation that I uh, use is actually coming from um, analyzing or comparing different languages um, around the Egyptian um, vicinity. Um, that I knew was spoken either just after the time or around the time as well. So I actually look into the, uh, if we go further back, I've actually checked into the Akkadian language uh, to actually see what type of vowels they use there. Um, the Greek as well, um, the, uh, the Hebrew, uh, the Arabic, uh, the Coptic, uh, the Latin, and um, African languages as well. Um, so I use the Ibo and the Urobo language as well. Um, so I'm usually here uh, with my partner. Um, she's actually uh, half Ibo, half Urobo, um, which is in Nigeria. And um, we actually uh, do the chanting and we try to make it sound as um, as authentically African as possible um, based upon co the combination of all those different uh, languages and attestation of uh, certain words in those languages um, but also bringing out um, an African feel to it. Usually we actually pronounce it with, instead of using a U sound, most of the words we base it off of is an O sound. Um, in the African languages or Nigerian language or the Ibo or even the Yoruba and the Urubo, um, you'll find that it's mainly O's for the vowels, um, O for the vowels. I'm not actually saying this is an authentic um, Egyptian way of pronouncing the words, but it's just something that helps me to actually learn, learn it um, by chanting it through, as you said, um, it's kind of like Arabic, but it is also a um, Nigerian way as well. So a lot of the time, um, we may say, we say words like, um, how can I say, let me find a word in English. Um, um, sorry, yo. Ah, ah. So we're saying sorry, but we actually add the O at the end. If you actually listen to a lot of Nigerian people speak or African people speak, there is always an O added at the end. So, Chimo, ah, ah, Chineke. You see these people now, we be doing these things over and over and over again, but they don't even understand. Uh -huh. So we show you this thing. So it's kind of like just mixing it all together, but trying to get a, a feel. <laughs> it's trying to get a feel that we're not even interested in, in, in making it sound as it sounds um, by going through the linguistic analysis, etc. But as long as looking it through linguistic, sort of linguistically, but actually uh, putting our own imprint on it for us to memorize it. Um, that's the major thing, is actually memorizing it ourselves. So I can't, I'm not going to push it to say this is the exact way you should be pronouncing it. Um, it's just the way that we've come up with to actually be able to memorize it and uh, recite it ourselves. So hopefully that, that gave you kind of an insight. No, yeah, yeah, it did. It yeah. did. Because there's, there's, there's an ongoing project done by a few people on setting up, you know, a... Um, more definitive structure on on replacing the vowels because we, we we bear witness to the consonants but the actual vowel replacement and so on uh, is an ongoing project so I think that um, if you had any input on that linguistically because they're, they're, they're using a scientific approach to how to replace the vowel so it won't be arbitrary you know and there's um, an agreement that it may not be historically 100 percent accurate but for the consensus, uh, you know, they're trying to be as scientific as possible. 
Yes. So um, once you, once I, once certain patterns are identified, then it becomes a lot easier, and then these patterns can be um, documented, and then it'll make it easier for people to learn, and then we can develop speech communities. So, like for example, in English, you know, be, because we grew up in speaking English, we know by looking at a word, we'll know okay what is the um, quality or quantity of the vowel and how to pronounce it because we, we grew up and we know English. Oh, okay, I think somebody was trying to get in. Um, so that same approach, you know, knowing, knowing um, like certain, certain uh, short and long vowels, certain consonants will dictate um, the quality of the vowel. And things like that. So a lot of linguistic work is being done, and it's kind of ongoing. So that's why I asked the question, because I was I was wondering if you have done some uh, linguistic work, and could add to the data that's being put together, or if this was just a consensus among you or or um, your peers, you know, like as you as you said to help you memorize it, and so on and so forth. So that was um, so you and you answered my question. Okay. Okay, that's good. I would definitely like to be um, involved with that project, uh, kind of get some insight. <coughs> so later on, we could actually um, discuss that. All right. So let's just do the last one just to finish up. Um, so, Nahisi. Yes. I need you to okay. start the first one off. I'm going to go lie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, good, good. That's it. And the next one is actually the beginning of your name again, which is the ne. The ne. ne. Yes. Ne. Yeah. Okay. And it says here, Ya uh, Nehebka Perma Te Petuf. So it says here, Ya Nehebka. Ya nehebka. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot. This is your bit here as well. What does this one say? Uh, parhemte, parhemte. Parma or oh, parma. Parma. Parma to come forth. Okay. Yeah. And then we see it's the same word again. Tephetuf or top hutuf or tephetuf. Okay. So it's coming forth from his cavern. So this one here, ya nehebka. Perma tepetuf is um, o joiner. So we know this word here means to join. Neheb means to join. And this one here, ka. So we're talking about ka. So we're joining the ka. So o joiner of the ka or o joiner of the spirit coming forth from tepetuf, his cavern. Okay? Um, that's how we've just translated it. Um, I wonder how Budge's translated it. Could you give Budge. us Budge's translation? Um, this, I mean, I lost it. Okay, Budge's translation would be uh, <clears throat> Hail Nehiplica, who comes forth from the hiding place. Okay, so. Um, pretty much the same again as the last one. Okay, and what we've got here. Okay. Um, on, the, on the negative, non, no. So that's it, that's the negative. Um, and we've got here nu nu arisa kit. So nu arisa kit. Um, so not have I. Not have I. Um, uh, kit kit kit. I think it means to cause damage. Um, let me just double check. Sa kit. Just a double check. Uh, where are we? Uh, where are we? 
it's uh, Keat. Okay, I've got it here as uh, not to cause any damage, basically. Not have I caused any damage. Um, Make sure where are we? Here, one, two, three, four, five. Circuit, not to cause any damage. Um, I don't want to actually hold this up any further. So, all right. So that's the first five that we've just done um, from the papyrus of Ani or Anui, um, and already we've established that it's talking. Uh, to 42 different deities um, representing Upper Egypt, um, the, all the way up to here. 22 deities representing Upper Egypt and 20 deities uh, representing uh, Lower Egypt. Um, and we've also established that in Budge's translation and most of the translations that we're receiving from Faulkner, um, Grimassa, um, uh, Dr. Ben, and so forth, they actually start from uh, number 42 and make their way to number one, where we can clearly see that it's the wrong orientation. And we also think that they completely leave out also uh, the deities themselves in some translations and actually um, the core and the epithets of the deity. So they completely leave this whole section off and only give you the translation of the bottom section, uh, not have I done this, not have I done that, um, maybe to actually make it seem palatable to you or to seem like uh, the, the, ten, uh, the Ten Commandments um, from the Bible um, um, also. Um, and we can also see that there's great depth of iconography going on here um, with uh, the symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt, um, which is the vulture's feather and uh, the wajet or the uh, the cobra or the snake, which representing the dual nature um, within nature or the dual natures of nature, which is to do with um, being either uh, reptilian or being avarian or mammalian, um, being warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Um, Operating on the floor or operating in the in the skies or in the heavens. And if you look at the cobra when it attacks, um, it usually attacks in a straightforward linear uh, motion. And uh, a vulture usually circles in the air um, before um, gathering its prayer, prey. Uh, which kind of, if we look at it from another uh, symbolic uh, way, we can see this actually represents the circle and the square. Um, uh, or the both hemispheres of the brain, one being logical and the other being uh, rational or creative in another sense. Um, and as we can see, this is actually representing um, the usekh ma'at, or the usekh ma'ati, uh, the halls of ma'at. So this whole thing is representing the double halls of ma'at. And you enter from one gate and you exit from another, and before entering and exiting, there is actually a guardian there that is demanding of you uh, the, the, the pass grip and the password uh, to lead you on to the next degree or to lead you in uh, to this actual uh, initiatic uh, process that's in place. Um, and as you can see, you're entering into the halls of double ma'at, um, being able to see the face of your lord, Osa and um, being judged um, on the scales. Um, it's very interesting to note, at this point in time, um, it's not actually your heart that is being weighed upon the scales. Okay? It's not actually your heart is actually on the scales, but it's not your heart at this moment in time that's actually uh, the main focus of weighing. It's um, ma'at is being weighed against your heart. 
okay? My act is being weighed against your heart. Meaning, do you know um, what is truth, what is justice, what is your knowledge like? Do you know what my act is before you're able to be weighed against uh, my act itself? So it's actually my act that's being weighed. Anubu is actually the one who's weighing my act against your heart. Then your heart is my act. And um, once you pass that task, um, and you have the wisdom represented by Jahuti or Tahuti or Thoth, um, you have been painted or you have been given uh, the symbol of Ma'at or the feather of truth and justice because uh, you know Ma'at. Um, and just to show you the difference uh, real quickly, um, where Ma'at is actually being weighed against the feather, um, where your Ma'at is being weighed and not actually your heart uh, will just go into uh, da -da 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 -da, real quickly over here do you see the opposite is uh, true where on this side the left hand side um, your heart is being weighed against my act do you see the difference there at all okay Okay. Okay. This one, the plum or the counterbalance is towards your heart. Yeah, and my act is being weighed. Whilst in this one, the counterbalance is against my act and your heart is being weighed. Do we see the difference? Yes. Yeah. So once you're able to, um, you've gathered that knowledge off my act, you now, or you've, you've done the negations, you're now able to pass um, and be um, actually uh, uh, challenged uh, to see if you pass to become ma'akhiru. Um, but that's for another uh, day, another teaching. Um, so if there's any questions uh, to be asked, uh, <coughs> ask. Now, can you um, just quickly on the point of um, of the text being uh, documented backwards in most of the translations? Could you show another plate? Like this is plate thirty-one, 30, and um, 31 to thirty-two or something like that. Yeah, thirty-one, and then the next one would be thirty-two. But on on this plate thirty-one, when, when it's documented in the textbooks translated, as you said, they start from they start backwards, but if you could show a different plate, just to show the, the how that the authors or these Egyptologists must have taken intentional. They did it intentionally, uh, whether it's right or wrong. But they there was an intentional decision made to do it backwards, as opposed to um, because someone asked a question a, a long while back. Uh, although you read read into the glyphs, could it be possible that they they should be read from left to right anyway? And the answer to that would would be able to um to show a different plate to show where they actually documented correctly. Where they documented correctly. Yeah. In other words, if you show another plate and look at the beginning, just how the beginning of this one is on the right hand side. Yeah. Um if you show another plate where the beginning is still on the right hand side, but when we look at the Egyptologist uh documentation in their books that they started in the correct place. That would indicate that for this particular uh, plate, there was an intentional decision to do it backwards. Okay. Um, well, to be honest with you, uh, okay. If you do you have at, plate one? Do you have plate one? Yeah, this, this, in fact, is actually plate one. This is actually plate one, um, but it's, it's being referred to as the final plate or the last plate. Um, and the final plate is referred to as the first plate. Uh, where are we? So this is plate. This is just plate one here. Just to ask, uh, they, they are for the whole field, but uh, you're basically, you're basically saying, I mean, didn't they just do that just to start from the left-hand side, like, like is a common tradition in English? 
or is there another reason why they started uh, from the left when when transliterating? Um, no, no. When when okay, if you if you go to Budge's um, if you go to Budge's interlinear version of the Book of the Dead, where he shows the glyphs as well as the transliteration and translation, if you look at plate thirty one, he's he's he writes it to facing the left. So all the glyphs are facing the left, but he starts with the actual left-hand column of the primary source. So that's either an error or that was an intentional decision by by Budge and possibly others to do it that way, and it and and it causes confusion because yeah, you, don't, right. you don't know yeah. if uh, I mean and because this is this is an important text. In order to understand, I mean, it's hard to understand anyway, but then to put it out of order just makes it more confusing. You, you're exactly right, because when I first joined in this class, or when I first got in, I opened up my Faulkner and my Budge, and I had to go through a process of everything you're explaining. I figured out that the one you guys were looking at was actually number 40 or 39 instead of number 4, which it would be if they did it in the correct order. Exactly. So that's the, that's the point. So I'm saying to... to for confirmation of that, or to look further into it, is if we could see the very first plate, like the one that's on the screen. This is yeah. the first plate, right? This is this is the this is the second plate, but it it should really be part of the first plate. Yes. Yeah, because see, there's a there's a there's a there's an interesting point in how they numbered it and how they had to separate it. Remember, this this was a, a long papyri that was connected that they that they cut they cut up and they numbered these plates so. The numbers could be maybe kind of a little arbitrary, mm. a little bit. So we have to uh, keep that in mind. But just for the sake of what I was saying, though, if we look at the one that you have here, you see how it says Dua, uh, the first word I, I, is uh, small now. But I believe it says Dua, Dua Ra, or pray adorations to Ra. Yes, it does. Okay, and it's on the right hand side. So if we look in Budge, uh, I'm not sure. Hold on one second. If we look in Budge and we see when he first starts to transliterate, translate the book, uh, yeah, which is on page one, uh, he has Dua Ra. So he does it correctly for this plate, but for that plate 31, he doesn't. So that that's something to to kind of point out, and remind other people uh, to avoid the confusion. That's right. That's right. Uh, just before you proceed, Caleb, can I ask what is the name of that book, copy of the Book of the Dead you have? Because I don't have transliteration in my copy. Uh, this is the Papyrus of Anio Anui. Oh, I have, yeah, I have that one. Um, I, I got a copy from Faulkner. I meant to talk to U Uaja, I mean Ujau about uh, what was your copy of the Book of the Dead? Oh, I have the interlinear version, which is uh, Budges, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Um, I can put a link. Uh, it's, it should be. A, it's available on Amazon. I, I'll put a link in the uh, right. chat or in cool. the Facebook. All right, I'm just listening, so I'm about to. Uh... I'm, I'm just wrapping it up right now, you know. Oh, I, I didn't know. I, I just came in late. It's all good. Uh, yeah, it's all good. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'm going to stop bro broadcasting, and we can actually just um, just talk, have a talk about it. All right, that's that's cool. Cool. Well, once you.